Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's very interesting to speak about futures in, in such a context. And my talk is called Designing Futures, Fiction to Reality and Back. And I'd like to explore how we could look into the most interesting things that are happening in the world today, design even more sort of advanced versions of that into the world of fiction so we could re-inspire back our reality. So I'm Monica and I design futures for a living. I started with designing fictional sci-fi worlds um, and then started being invited by technology companies to help them imagine the future geopolitical, social, cultural future that technologies, platforms, and products would be set in. Um, and as of late, uh, cities and governments started reaching out to me to help them imagine fictional futures for the very real places. Um, I'll show you a little bit of the Hollywood work that I've done, um, and then I will walk all the way back to it, towards the end. <coughs> so it gives you some visual ideas of the kind of worlds that I have explored and how we'll connect, hopefully, to what I have to say. So Nnedi Okorafor says, science fiction is one of the greatest forms of political writing. I think science fiction world design is one of the most powerful forms of political imaging. And we don't think enough about that. Why? Because there is no one future. We speak about all these technological developments and imagine that that's the way that that's going to go. But there is no one future. There are only possible future scenarios. In a similar way, we kept being asked the answers. As futurists, we are supposed to know where things are going to go. But there are no one answer. There is no one answer. There are only choices. And these choices are the choices that we, all of us, are making every day. Our choices are very much informed by the media that we consume. Media, in fact, is the modern day mythology. It builds the foundation for our values and shapes our policies. And cultures are not just defined by the stories they tell, but also by the ones that they don't. And so what about if we look into the kind of media that we've been consuming about the future? And I'm not talking about science fiction books or sort of more avant-garde projects in sport exploring future. I'm talking about mainstream media, sci-fi movies and blockbuster, um, you know, any kind of blockbuster video games as well as TV series even some of the ones that I work on. Although when I work on them, I try to bring in as much as possible of the magic and beauty and wonder and diversity into them, they are still mostly dystopian futures. So what do these dystopian futures lack? Number one, diversity. Cultural diversity, but also the one of abilities. Do you remember when is the last time you saw an indigenous person in a sci-fi scenario? Do you remember when you saw Africa or Afrofuturistic visions in the sci-fi world that, again, were not heavily dystopian. What about South America? What about South Asia? Even Asia, places like Korea, Japan, China, they're usually only present when they're fetishized. We talk about replacement <coughs> body parts and enhancing our abilities. However, people that are differently able, abled are barely ever present in these future scenarios. My point number two is ritual and spirituality. In the Western world, we have forgotten about rituals and spirituality in many instances of our lives. That is not the case with the largest population in our world. Almost everywhere in Asia and Africa and South America, spirituality is still a key part of people's lives. However, whenever we think of these future narratives, it's always just about fighting and killing and struggling and trying to survive. And we've forgotten completely what are the things that give people meaning to their lives, what make them want to fight for their lives. So could we imagine what would spirituality and rituals beyond just the ones confined to book religions would look like? Point number three, creativity. Right? We think and talk about all these technologies that are just there to solve problems. But is solving problems enough? We are creative animals. We are playful animals. In fact, that's how we evolve from the primates. The need to play is a vital human need. From, of course, 
the moment we are born, throughout our childhood, teenage years, but also all the way into our adulthood. So can we imagine how we'll be using all these amazing technologies from augmented virtual mixed reality to AI, to drone technologies, to exoskeleton bodysuits, also for creative purposes? Can we imagine these future cities that are not just steel, glass, concrete, but also how, they, how creativity, how public art could also really hack that urban design. That leads me to point number three, to point number four, youth and street culture. is almost completely absent from these future narratives. Whenever we see the children or the teenagers, they're mostly tokens for adult fantasy. They're never true actors with their own agency. And that becomes really detrimental for our kids. They need their own heroes. They need their own superheroes. Can we imagine how the future kids will be using these exoskeleton bodysuits to break dance? Can we imagine these future cities where we will use biotech to create massive public art projects that young people could come together and express themselves through that? Can we imagine kids being actors in the sustainability movement and project that into this future world. I think it could very much help our youth today to imagine the agents that they can have in a present moment. Point number five, gender beyond stereotypes. We can imagine to galactic space travel, however, we still see objectified female body and alpha male stereotype superheroes. We still see families that are hugely heteronormative, that is not the case already today. How come that somebody like me, who is a present-day person, is more futuristic than most of the women that are being depicted in these future scenarios? So we need to ask ourselves more from that. We need to also to see families depicted that are gay, bi, trans, co-parenting, etc., etc., Because that way we'll, af we'll avoid more of the harassment and hate crimes also in this world. Bodily futures. We talk again about all these things that we'll be able to do to our bodies, yet somehow sexuality, our appreciation of what is beautiful, of how we treat ourselves and the others, in this future world somehow is not changed. So we need to think about that as well. What is it positive science and technologies, as well as people that represent these domains? How come Again, we are so lacking in that. Somehow the villains are always the scientist or the technologist, and then we wonder how we end up with the anti-intellectualist movement. Fake news is not the problem. The problem is that it finds the fertile ground in which to grow. So if we keep just having these narratives where science and technology is perceived as an evil force, it indeed becomes that. Environmental awareness. How many movies you've seen of dystopian futures where all of, the, all of the greenery has been destroyed? How many city designs in these blockbuster movies you've seen that would have natural environment and urban design enmeshed? How many examples of tech can you find that were inspired by biomimicry in these fictional narratives? Although that is very much one of the most interesting areas today. You even saw my slides. I keep wanting to work on greener futures and keep being commissioned to do more cyberpunk. And every time I push for more green and every time I get asked for more cyberpunk. One of my last points, values evolution. We talk about access being more important than ownership in the future. We talk about youth today, already the real youth in the world today, having almost a disgust for ownership of things. And yet, we keep projecting the sort of late-stage capitalistic version of the world as the only version of the world, no matter how far we go into the future. And the last point, community narratives. Singular superhero narrative has become so predominant that it ends up with possibility for somebody like Donald Trump going up there and somewhat credibly saying that he and only he alone can save America. A single man can fuck things up. 
but we'll never fix everything. We can only fix things if we come together beyond our genders, races, cultures, disciplines. So could we imagine more of the narratives like that? As we've seen by the very few examples I've cited and so many more that you can imagine, the fictions we tell bleed back into reality. Ideas have impact. The media we create becomes us. Those who control the fantasy, could we say that they're the ones that somewhat control the future? The real challenge today is to imagine a future that has hope in it. Being hopeful about the future is almost like being the new punk. And this hope cannot be in technology. Technology is not the magic pill. The hope is and has to be in humanity. Because technological innovation without humanitarian evolution always, always, always equals dystopian future. What we need is new perspectives of what future can be. Maybe the future that has an erased ritual, future that does contain color, texture, flavor. Maybe the future that is not disembodied. Future that has life in it and not just theory of the future within it. A dear friend of mine, an Indian innovator and developer, Manvendra Singh Shekhavat, wrote to me, I want to marry heritage diversity and human potential, create regenerative ecosystems that celebrate life and learning, curiosity and creation, uniqueness and interaction. I want to participate in creating the future vision that is equally forward-looking and responsible. There is a way we could bridge past and future with grace and without resorting to nostalgia or raising the heritage entirely. We just have to ask more out of our own imaginations. Because nostalgia is poison. But so is techno-fetishism. Just wanting to bring something back, <coughs> even the vision of a future, that one of the 80s, that so many of the sci-fi movies seem to be stuck in, stops the progress, does not allow us to see new spaces. But in a similar way, getting just fascinated with the new shiny gadgets does not allow us to see really what is the effect that they could have on us. My yoga teacher once pointed out to me that in Western art, the artist is allowed to vomit their psychosis without acknowledging the effect it has on the audience. And it's, tr and it's very true. Where we're heading in the content space is augmented virtual mixed reality. We're leaving the rectangular screens. Where is my screen? We're leaving these rectangular screens behind and stepping into the computational space, devices that will be as small as this, where the world becomes our desktop. We're not watching it anymore. We are in it. It's a visceral medium. We are moving from that content frame to the content matrix. So all the experience, violence or horror, becomes that more potent and can become that more crippling, not just to our imaginations, but also to our bodies. So the responsibility in how we think about the content we create, and especially the content about the future that we create, rises even further. So instead of continuing to think of stories we tell, be it in a game format, or film format, or in the future immersive media format? Could we stop thinking about it as things that are virtual, as things that are just games, and start thinking of them as a shared reality? What is the reality we want to share the others? What is the reality we want to walk ourselves in? And how do we do that? It's by opening our imagination by triggering and searching and seeking out the conversations beyond the borders, again, of genders, cultures, generations, abilities, disciplines, and transforming these conversations into active collaborations for the outcomes of transformation. I like to cite Elon here, Elon Musk. The value of beauty and inspiration is very much underrated. Now, he's a total absolute nerd who mostly underrates the value of beauty and inspiration as well. And I know that because 
But yet he recognizes that. That even for the craziest technologies that we're developing, the vision of the world towards which we're developing is equally important. And we have to work these two things in parallel. So creatives have a key role to play in designing tomorrow. Because only smart future plus creative future equals regenerative future. The damage has been done. Sustainable future is not enough. We have to work towards regenerative future. We have to stop being this destructive force, learn to become sustainable civilization, so that then we could be regenerative intelligence. And for that, creativity is vital. And by doing that, we could indeed expand the human potential. Physically, obvious, we all want and need that. Intellectually as well, most of us in this room would agree, but also creatively. And more important than anything, emotionally. And why to do that? Why to think about these story worlds? Because maybe that can forget, help us forget the daily rut of our reality and imagine really that future as a possibility space that we could then work backwards from and bring it back to our very present lives. Now is the future. Future is always now. None of us here are doing marketing or tech or art or advertising or science. We are, in fact, creating the culture of the future that all of us will be inhabiting, at least the lucky of us. The scope of our reality is defined by the scope of our dreams. So I want to share my dream with you. I dream of futures that are post-gender, post-race, and post-nation state. It doesn't mean that there should be no more gender, no more race, or no more, gender, or no more nation state. It means that maybe we should not be defined anymore by something that we're born into and didn't choose. I dream of futures where cultures can merge in ways not predefined and create freely new languages. I dream of futures not just socially and environmentally, but also culturally engaged. I dream of futures where generosity, laughter, honesty, tenderness, love, awe, kindness, art are no less part of the human narrative than natural disasters, societal collapse, or global warfare. I dream of futures that allow more of us to discover, appreciate, and protect the wonders of this world of ours, so infinitely small and so immensely vast. And what I want to share with you now is simply the kind of things that I find in my nomadic life. Since five years, I went on this journey to just travel the world and seek out visions of a future, not just in the labs and fabs of Silicon Valley and Tokyo, which I do, but also in the depths of Sahara Desert and Amazon Forest and Rajasthani palaces. And so this is just my Instagram feed. These are just casual shots of beautiful moments that I find in this world. And so, you remember those slides of the work that I shared, of the kind of future story worlds that I design. What I would like is not my movies look like my Instagram feed, but be somewhere in between, right? The future doesn't have to be perfect. The future doesn't have to be all utopia. But if we could manage to inject just a little bit more of humanity, of love, and of wonder into it, maybe it could indeed become better. So what I dream about is the futures on the other side of impossibility. What is the future that you dream? Thank you.